All right, everybody um, online and here in real life. Uh, thank you all for coming and joining us for this uh, kickoff event of our fall 2022 semester for the Center for Archiving Futures. Um, I'm Victoria Van Heining, I'm an assistant professor of library innovation here at College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. Uh, College Park is located on the ancestral territories of the Piscataway, Nakashtong, and their indigenous kin and neighbors. As members of the University of Maryland, we acknowledge as a land grant university the 202,000 acres of stolen indigenous land taken and distributed to the university under the Morrill Act in 1862. We want to acknowledge the separation that these and many other acts of colonialism, assimilation, and genocide, which include archival collecting generated between indigenous peoples and their homelands. We honor the continued power and resilience of indigenous communities and nations and celebrate the collaborative and decolonizing work now taking place in our collections and our institutions. We further acknowledge the University of Maryland's connections to slavery and to generations of racialized trauma rooted in this institution. As a member college of universities studying slavery, USS, the University of Maryland has undertaken the 1856 project committed to investigating and illuminating these histories. The 1856 project endeavors to lay a path toward restorative history, allowing for the institution to engage in the work of moral accountability and reconciliation. Through this work, the University of Maryland recommits itself to creating equitable, inclusive, and diverse curricula and spaces. So as I said at the start, today's event is part of the Center for Archival Futures or CAFE speaker series. We typically meet um, on the first Wednesday of each month during semesters, um, but we wanted to give everybody to the chance to catch their collective breath. So we went from mid-September. Um, our events, including this one, are typically recorded, whether they're hybrid or in person. And we make them available usually a couple of weeks at the latest after the event. Um, and these uh, go up on cafe.ischool.umb.edu slash events. And um, for those who are on the webinar, please feel free to put your questions in Q&A. And we'll circle back to them at the end. But our uh, wonderful panelists are going to introduce their work, have a conversation, and then um, we'll have uh, a broader discussion after that. Um, <laughs> I was going to read everybody's amazing, illustrious bio, but I was told, and I quote, Victoria, don't come into the time. <laughs> I don't know um, but I just want to share very briefly, first start of the talk, yeah, um, that I am I'm so honored and so excited to be welcoming folks who are on sort of the full end of the spectrum from activism to archiving. And I think Junius to some extent, that question of how do we as historians and students reuse and start to make sense of and engage with our history as it's happening in this contemporary moment, um, how can it feed the work that we do um, both, both ends? How does activism feed the archiving and archiving to activism? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers who will introduce themselves and then get into the story of the Black Lives Matter Memorial Fund's uh, archiving project. Okay, so uh, we are trying to cram three years worth of experience into less than an hour and we have time for questions. So we're going to maybe set some timers if we have to at some point. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the clock. And we're all very aware that uh, we're trying to get through to the archival process for you as soon as possible. Our story is one of a massive organic protest that became known as the Black Lives Matter Memorial Fence. Uh, and through the efforts of all who came to know the space, was protected from the elements and from the government and Trump supporters. Uh, collected and archived and will one day soon be available to be witnessed by the public online in its last incarnation. Our story uh, starts in a whole bunch of different places. So we're just going to go through and uh, have people tell you uh, where we were uh, in May of 2020 after George Floyd was murdered. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Farley. 
Um, I work at the DC Public Library in the People's Archive, which is the local history department. In May of 2020, um, I was on lockdown like everybody else working at home. Um, personally, I was living in Capitol Hill and um, lived there throughout 2020 and much of 2021 and experienced firsthand a lot of the things that happened there. Um, professionally, the library was trying to figure out how to collect and preserve what was happening in the moment and um, ultimately led us to also look at some of our practices around metadata creation and um, really revise how we describe people, movements, and identities. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jimmy Squirk of the Fourth. Most people call me Jim. Um, I am a second year master's student at the illustrious Howard University and I also work at the illustrious Moreland Springer under Dr. Miss Lila Sewell Williams, who's also right there. Um, May 2020, I was actually create, working to create a sort of Zoom example, Zoom sort of webinar focusing on, it was called The Harsh Reality, a conversation on the intersectionality of race and gender. And um, for me during that time, it's, all, it's always very interesting because I feel like when a black man is unjustly murdered by the police, like we treat it as it's such a new thing, a big thing, but for me and my little brother, of course, like we have been, and not just me and my little brother, but for black men across the world, this is something that we're used to. Um, the police always, it's so interesting to know, because one of my topics, I don't know if someone in school is looking at how hip hop is a form of power or history for African-American communities. And it's so interesting how um, there's always a talk of gang culture in the community when it comes to black communities, but we don't talk about how the police are the biggest gang in the world. They just are politically you know, supported. And um, for me, just during that time, it was definitely a time of just very, it was, it's very interesting because I guess you kind of, we're in, we're in the pandemic. I've never been through a pandemic. I don't know if anybody else has, but I've never experienced that. So, um, of course, getting acclimated with living in a pandemic, then you also have to reacclimate yourself to the emotion of seeing another black man maliciously murdered. Um, for me, it was it was interesting because, of course, you, you you're in this space of being trying to be a historian and trying to, of course, use the books, use the traditional route. But for me, it was kind of like, what can I do to kind of get more involved? How does it? A young person like me who might not know that much, but I still want to get involved. I still think I have a voice in my own culture. And so um, I spent 2020 a lot just really trying to, of course, prepare for my senior year, prepare for how I would like to go about it. Of course, getting involved in um, being a Howard grad student, getting involved with my brother, of course, being on campus with me, of course. Just it was a it was a whirlwind of emotions because it's just like you spend your life trying to, I guess, do do right by society when that same society doesn't want to see you do right. And, of course, being that me and my brother are part of our own statistic, um, not having our father in our lives right now, we've kind of always been placed in this sort of space of, I'm supposed to be in somebody's game, I'm supposed to be on somebody's t-shirt, I'm supposed to be in somebody's job. But the reality of it is that's not the case. And so for May, May 2020 was definitely a period of reflection for myself, just thinking about how do I intend to use my youthfulness to go into a field that's mainly dominated by white males and white people who don't know my story but are the people we look to for validation for talking about other stories so you know. let's skip Nadine and go to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back we'll come back and with that uh, I'm Jody Hoover I am the digital resources manager at Enoch Pratt Free Library and in May of 2020, we were just uh, considering uh, ways to come back on site to work at the library. Um, and in particular, it was very, it was a conversation because, you know, staff were very fearful of being on site. And yet, you know, on the backdrop of the George, George Floyd murders, you know, there was also sort of the parallels between that and the Freddie Gray uprising in Baltimore and how the library had played uh, such a huge part in being a haven for people, you know, a place to go. Um, and we couldn't be that. Um, and what did that look like? Um, so. Hi, I'm Eliza Loventhal. I'm the head of technical services for the Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress. Sorry, it's not cool. Can't get around it. Um, 
I, on May of 2020, I also, I live in uh, Columbia Heights, Mar uh, not Columbia Heights, Maryland, oh my goodness, DC. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing's wrong with Columbia Heights, Maryland. <laughs> but um, I, on, on a daily basis, I was, we were, we were also uh, uh, quarantined, working from home. Every day I was going out though, um, pretty much around 5 a.m. because that's when I felt safe, no one else was out, so I didn't always need to have a mask on. And, um, on occasion, as there were protests, was going out and trying my best to feel comfortable in protest space. Um, but uh, after after the um, protest, and I'm going to just skip forward just a little bit out of May into June, mm -hmm. um, the, when the fence goes up, um, mm -hmm. to, to provide that introdu introduction there, um, the first instantiation of the fence... Okay, can you explain what the fence is, please, real quick? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, it was a uh, perimeter 10-foot high fence put around the uh, Lafayette Square uh, uh, Park and connected to uh, other parts of it. And then actually it was an extension all the way around the presidential White House complex, um, and all the way to uh, Independence Avenue. Um, and, uh, or Constitution. thank you, sorry. Um, and the first time the fence went up, I couldn't help myself. I needed to go down and look at it. Uh, the Library of Congress has a long standing history of collecting protest art, and um, we can only take abandoned uh, things or things that people say we can have, we can't take things down. And so I went around and took photos. So, the first so how long after the fence went up before things started getting plastered on it? Um, almost, um, like within well, days. But like it, it was no, like no, almost no, immediately. Like people because there were already like, active protests and people were exactly. using they were, and, they, and they weren't necessarily doing a great job of like hanging them, mm -hmm. but they were putting them up next to the fence and then people were fastening them, duct tape, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first time I saw this, it was super powerful, and then two days, two or three days later, um, there, uh, June June sixth, they said, "Oh, there's a chance that it's going to come down." And I again freaked out and wrote to everybody in the you know, the curator of uh, posters and and fine prints and the chief of my division and said, "I got to go down and see what's going to happen because if they take down this, then it's abandoned and we should we should take this in." I hope that's okay. And um, <laughs> and then zoom off and take photos, and it turns out that they're not taking the fence down right away. And we have we have some time, and so that sort of that sort of leads in, and I'll 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 leave it there. But basically, from that day on, I took daily photos of the fence. Sometimes twice a day. Sometimes three times. Sometimes three times <laughs> through the whole. Yeah, for eight months. Yeah. So June sixth to January thirty first. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And Nadine, <laughs> after George Floyd was murdered, um, before September, take that jump. Before September. Yeah, between George Floyd being murdered and September. Oh well. When I don't watch broadcast television, so I did not really, I did not know of the murder immediately, but I had been at the White House protesting the former guy. So I was down there all the time anyway, but then um, I heard of the murder maybe the day after or two days after when um, somebody called me the Friday night. So he got with the Monday and then the Friday night, somebody called me and said, are you going to go down to the White House? And I was like, so you had already been in front of the White House. How much? Oh, since um, um, since July of 2018, mm -hmm. we had been consistently protesting the former guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was um, so a friend called and said, "Are you going to go, go down?" That was a Friday night, and we decided not to go down. And then it turned out the Saturday was the. Um, first they did it actually, you know, well, it, it erupted the Friday night, but Saturday it actually started and they had um, um, uh, a, a car protest where we had a car protest and then consistently that's when the the fire started and the destruction started um, that Friday. I mean, that Saturday. And then after a week that fence came down? Oh, but no, no, but you said where I was in Until September. May. Okay, okay, okay. Give me well, until September. okay. We so, only got a minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> the, fence, the fence went up on June 2nd. And somewhere along, as um, Eliza said, maybe around the 6th, word got out that it was going to come down. But it actually, um, the community came together on the 9th of June and took everything down. And then the fence itself came down on the 11th. Yes. But on the 9th of June, the um, BLM community came, um, maybe about 20 of us, and we took everything down. and. And Acacia Museum came by, um, Smithsonian. the Smithsonian came by, and other 
entities came by and took some of the items, but a lot of the items were left there. People like me, I took home maybe 20, 30 pieces because they were just thrown on, on, you know, on the ground. And then how long after that, next fence went up because okay. they tried to take down the statue. Okay, so I was consistently there because um, I'm a home organizer and because of COVID, people weren't hiring, so I wasn't doing anything. And I had been there protesting anyway, so I just stayed a little longer than usual. And on the 22nd of June, the Black community, the BLM community decided they wanted to pull down the Andrew Jackson statue because they had pulled down the Pike statue the Friday before and the MPD just sat around and laughed about it. <laughs> so they, took, <laughs> they got emboldened and thought they could pull down the Andrew Jackson statue the Monday, but the Fed said, no, no, no. So they, they attempted to pull it down. They weren't successful. Um, MPD and the past police pushed them out to I Street, closed down the area, and then it reopened on, overnight into the, on June 24th. And that fence remained until May 10th of 2021. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. okay. The fence but remained. starting a lot, it, it, they, they would shut the gate and not let people in the park and then open the gate and let people back in the park and then shut the gate, right, for a chunk of time. So your final destination was usually the White House as close as you can get to scream at the former guy, right? Right. So And then as you as you were muscled out, I mean, obviously you're walking by the fence, but as you were muscled out, spending more and more time in front of the fence itself. Is that accurate? So um, the protest was ongoing. People would they would have these spontaneous protests that would just break out. Somebody would be there. Somebody would come with a with a megaphone and say, "Let's go to Mitch McConnell's house." And we, twenty five of us, or whatever, would go to Mitch McConnell. <laughs> we would go shut down three ninety five. I think like three times I went, we went with people who shut down three ninety five. I'm sure people were probably in traffic. We didn't understand. We shut it. So um, it was ongoing and. Um, what else do you want me to say? Oh, you're good. Okay, so we are plowing through. Do you need more? Do you can you please uh, share with me more? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm going to try and make it really, really short. Okay. I'm Karen. I'm the stage manager for the resistance. She's the warrior goddess for the resistance. She had that name. Not self-appointed. I not self-appointed. <laughs> my name was developed out of uh, my ultimate function uh, that I didn't know when I got there. And uh, when George Floyd was murdered, I was already uh, two months into the apocalypse in Hell's Kitchen in New York City, and uh, twenty thousand of our neighbors had dropped dead. And and then uh, there was a you know almost nine minute government sanctioned snuff film that was uh, circulated and all hell broke loose. And uh, New York was fascinating because you could be in a protest and then decide you needed to start heading home and join up with another protest as you were heading home. But as the months went on, people got tired. There was less and less to do. And at some point, RBG died. I had a meltdown and I just turned to people and was like, I guess I gotta go to DC. <laughs> and um, I went to DC assuming that by then, because there was a judicial branch, by then, like the whole country, all the unemployed bartenders, all the unemployed artists, they would all be there and they would be circled around. I'm, I'm kind of a weird of Pollyanna, I know. But they would all be swarming the White House and uh, there would just be a protest that I would just end up in. And I got there and it was a, on a Tuesday. It was pretty much a ghost town. And I found the White House anti-nuclear peace vigil. See, all the people in D.C. were exhausted because they'd already been gassed by the cops and during the Trump photo op and all that kind of stuff. And there were a lot of stay away orders on them. And there were a lot of a lot of humans that, you know, were so traumatized from that summer that they just weren't out like in Lafayette Square Park, right? Middle of the week, pandemic had hit DC harder by then, which we already proved that we could be outside without masks because we'd already had months of it, right? About being ground zero and DC was encroaching on their time when they were ground zero. Okay, uh, then I get to, I meet the White House and the Blue Peace Vigil and then I meet Nadine. And the first day I met her, she was wearing this mask. <laughs> and I looked at took one look at her and went, I found you. <laughs> I didn't know why I was there, I didn't know how long I was staying. I had nothing to do in New York, and I just knew that I was supposed to be in DC. 
And eventually I realized uh, that the park was shutting more and more. I started working third shift for the White House anti-nuclear peace vigil and spending more time with Nadine outside the fence as she tended to it. And within the course of this, uh, my only goal was get more people out here. There need to be more people here. And I kept going, we're all the people, we're all the people. And so I started making little videos, not that anyone ever watched them, hoping that someday someone would see them. And this is Nadine. This is my new favorite film. When I came to DC to protest literally everything and found the William Thomas Memorial Anti-Nuclear Peace Vigil that sits in front of the White House holding down the fort for our First Amendment rights, I found Nadine. She makes her own signs and masks and shirts. And since the fence that was erected by Trump to keep protesters away during the BLM protests has become a memorial fence representing voices from all over the country and the lives of our neighbors killed by the police or in police custody, Nadine tends to as if it were her own, protecting it and fixing and rehanging signs that are torn down by Trump supporters. She sweeps the sidewalk in front of it. She grieves when things are stolen from it that she did not even place there. She protects our voices. She does not associate herself with the peace vigil because she says she is not peaceful. Though she helps out when needed, and her brand of protest is righteous and loud and falls in the space where the need for peace and human rights is monumental and direct and angry and deserves to be angry. Trump is there. Yes, he is. No, Trump. No, they, no racist USA. That was my speech. You are the one who promises the country is in danger of becoming a dictatorship on the Trump. Yes. Police brutality. One of the reasons that most people make baby is because police brutality is not stopping. And it happens in a month of a cop who doesn't realize that he's racist. So I I have to put this here because it's happening to the life. But this, this was about three police officers from South Carolina who was heard on tape saying that they this wanted to start the their, their I don't have four more years in need to fight Trump because he will allow the police to continue to this. I don't have four more years. Please, please come the road. Hold him out! Hold him out! This message was not paid for because there are some things more important than money. <laughs> okay, so um, basically that is to give you like what what I was inspired by seeing the care that was being taken at that time. There were not uh, lots of direct threats. This is all before uh, the election. This is all before Halloween even. And um, uh, about at, around that time when I was there, I started calling you a curator. And I would say, I'm a docent. Talk to the curator. I'm just a docent. I, was like, <laughs> I, I, I had a, a, a long learning curve of trying to figure out how to be the middle-aged white lady named Karen in front of the Black Lives Matter Memorial Fence. <laughs> it's incredibly fascinating. And I actually got to witness firsthand the whole people come up and talk to me, even though I obviously am somebody's bitch because I'm doing, I'm doing terrible, stupid jobs right there, right? But they come up and talk to me because apparently it's more comfortable to come up and talk to a middle-aged white lady named Karen. Things that you heard that you knew, but that you didn't actually experience. And then learning how to pivot that and say, okay, this person wants to know about this. Oh, you need to talk to Filippos. This person wants to hear about this. You need to talk to Nadine. Someone from Fox News. Oh, you need to talk to this unhoused guy that talks to people I can't see you know things like that like being able to you know being able to kind of funnel things with while staying under the radar and figure out what balls i get to pick up so the curation stuff you basically started right um i'm calling this i'm calling this your first moment of active deliberate curation however i will call out so because i was taking photos every single day uh -huh. And the fence, when, when the fence came down in front of Lafayette Square, all the signs basically moved onto the scaffolding on the Commerce Building because it was under construction and it was a huge amount of space. Great territory, wonderfully used. Right. But I would notice every day something that was in one spot had just been moved a little bit over and it was in a better spot. Um, mm -hmm. Almost always in a better spot. Right. And, and like making sure that everything could be seen or like this message is in perfect conflict. I'd like them to be next to each other. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. I truly couldn't have, like, I, I, I knew that I was there every day and I knew that someone else was doing this. I, I was confident it was not my, I, I wasn't going insane. Right. And it took a long time, but you're right. It was around this time, but I was like, 
I, I caught her in action one day and I took a picture being like, I found her. And <laughs> 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 it was before we actually introduced ourselves because mm -hmm. I was in quite, quite shy of the pandemic. I'm not trying to get in anyone's space, but I definitely was like, I found the person who's doing this. I'm not insane. There is a curator. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> tell us real quick about this, this, this guy right here. Yeah. Okay. So this was, if, if you happen. can see it, um, it is directly in front of what would be the white, the house, the front door of the White House. And it became a photo of people were coming to take pictures. I am personally, I am an atheist, so this kind of irritated me, you know, it being the focal thing where we were being killed, but this is what somebody put. And, um, but one day I came, I came by and somebody had torn it down. It wasn't all the way down, it was hanging. And I said to myself, since somebody started the job, I will, <laughs> I will finish it and I took it up. And I didn't take it down because I did not know if the Black community had put it there. So out of respect for the Black community, I had left it. But once I realized that it was not the Black community who had put it there, but rather Trump supporters mm -hmm. and the Christian evangelists, then, then I made a conscious decision that that is not going to be on the fence to pacify us, to say that, okay, we need to be... We need to stop protesting and um, we need to, to you know, just keep praying and everything is going to change. It hasn't changed in 204 years. That wasn't going to be the full point of the film. So I made sure anytime they put any of those kind of signs up, those huge, huge signs that took up all that um, um, what it, um, real estate, real estate, I took them down. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is just something quick I made to kind of give you a, a feeling about what the month of September was. And this takes you through um, uh, the uh, what the fence, which wasn't just a fence with stuff on it. It was a community and an ever evolving, changing community that was created within that space, from that space and for that space. And it takes you into uh, the first time we realized we couldn't leave. Disruption of the, the first mass disruption, but people had been destroying the fence um, passively. Yeah, passively. They were just pass and tear down a piece and tear down a piece. Right. And they, they were doing that for, for ages. Mm -hmm. But the first mass destruction was on the 27th of October, mm -hmm. right? The, 20, the, 20, the 26th of October, where um, Amy Comey Barrett was um put on the supreme court the day that she was she has submitted the supreme because court because all those christians came yeah. to support christians i'm sorry right. came to support her um they were and, praying on and BLM praying BLM to the white Plaza. house and praying to that right. was the screening those and days. then after after they prayed on blm plaza mm -hmm. for amy comey barrett they came and destroyed the memory of 
people who were murdered by the police and they were led by two black women. Mm -hmm. And that is what irritated me the most with this whole thing is that these two black women allowed these white nationalist people more, more or less to, to let them come and destroy the memory of black people who were murdered by the police. So you can yeah. Community showed up, rally the next day, Yay! talked to Nadine off the ledge. <laughs> Bunch of stuff was saved from that pile, and the rest is history. <laughs> okay, so in this moment, real quick, let's go. This is um, October 26th. These are Eliza photos. We can dig through and find every day of the freaking fence in a Amazon account from Eliza. It's amazing. <laughs> if, if we're like, um, when was this up? Eliza can find it, right? Great resource for that yes. because she was actively there making archives daily. And I, and I actually used... Um, Eliza's photo in the end, um, at the end of the process when we were scanning, mm -hmm. there were faces that I didn't know, people who were not Breonna Taylor mm -hmm. and George Floyd. I didn't know who they were, but people had come to the press and put their names and put the date that they were murdered. I used Eliza's photos too, because they had been, you know, the wind and the weather and everything had um, mm -hmm. um, faded and mm -hmm. I used her photos to fill in the information. Mm -hmm. So uh, then um, one of the things that happened about this point was there was more active involvement from you in messaging. So messaging sometimes then became something that was a direct um, response to not just the external threats of the world, right? Like Amy Coney Barrett or, or whatever, um, but to the internal threats for the fence. So uh, one of the uh, first, uh, I mean, experiences actually i don't have a picture of that one but um i actually made this mm -hmm. i this is one of the very few signs i made that i wrote for myself and i made it to be destroyed because they were all still in town and they wanted to rip something up and be mad about something because that's what they do they like to destroy things so i took a sheet and i wrote something that would and i put it on a pole in front of the fence and i did it strategically so they would go after that and not the important stuff and it got ripped up like three times i think i ever made another sheet right it worked it was like a distraction to keep uh, for us to know when they're coming after something so then we could line up in front of the fence and make sure things that were important uh, didn't get lost. So not only did messaging sometimes change uh, for the purpose of strategy of protection, but it also changed based on um, things that uh, we want to say, mostly you, you wanted to say. Well, well um, what was the Jesus? Okay, so <laughs> one of the people who were the fence, she, um, she, started a series called Jesus Knows. And she decided- We will not be silent, just the name of the organization. They've right. got the black, the white letters on black background. Mm -hmm. You might see it at other protests. So she she had this series called Jesus Knows. Jesus Knows that white supremacy is a myth and Jesus knows. So she did a, a maybe probably about a good 20 of them. And from she having done that, that inspired me to make this large, very large one that says Jesus knows that black lives need more than thoughts and prayers, which went into this where they had put on the fence at one point, Jesus saves in this bright, right. this bright yellow um, plastic with black writing. The whole, I mean, every column had like probably two of them, Jesus saves. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I would take them down, as I told you. I would just, um, at first I was doing it on the cover, but then I would just bold face, I would just go up and it, once you leave, it's coming down. <laughs> so it was a fight with us. And, you know, I mean, I was there more than them. So I won. We'd spray them. And then um, Nadine would say, well, because she doesn't fancy herself an artist. So I'd get commissioned to actually do the print. And she'd have like a idea in her head of what she wanted to say. And I would, I would do the thing and then it would go up. And um, sometimes that worked against us. We'll go into that at some other date if anybody ever cares, because I'm trying to get you to archiving. Um, <laughs> and uh, real quick, um, this is uh, another thing that eventually the whole wall was plastered. Um, so after the election, after the yeah, right before the election, the whole the whole fence was plastered, and they wanted to take pictures of the White House, so we made them a little hole, and then Nadine <laughs> filled around everything with a bunch of losers. And I wrote, take pics of your White House the, here so they could take pictures made. of the White House. So we right? still made sure we still made sure that the people, the purpose of the fence, which was the uh, memory of the people who were killed by police, that right. it was still there. And also curation-wise, there was a deal with Black Lives Matter. 
Go ahead. Say that, that they didn't want because during the election the fence changed as sub, like when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, a lot of feminist stuff came on the fence. Mm -hmm. Then when the election came, more vote Biden, stuff, like yeah. vote stuff, yeah. and then after. Um, this one, it's a very long guy. fence. So the fence would keep people from putting stuff right. up if it's a messaging that's important to them. But but Black Lives Matter, the groups did not want the former guy centered. Mm -hmm. They felt that he put up the fence to stifle our voices and he shouldn't be centered on the fence. So they wanted a lot of the anti Trump stuff. To, I quote his name. Oh. Ah. <laughs> But they wanted that's what they come up and they wanted the center of the fence to be Black Lives Matter related. Mm -hmm. So we did that and we put all we put everything else. So the then feminist we're taking stuff and stuff the down, rearranging it. Where's business. it go in this section? You know, that kind of stuff. Putting like things together. Mm -hmm. I felt uh, totally comfortable moving any kind of feminist or vote stuff and whatnot. And there was a long period of time where I go, where should this go, Nadine? Because I'm the middle-aged white lady and I'm here in front of the Black Lives Matter Memorial Fence. And she finally told me, you get it, just move it. <laughs> but what I didn't like to, mm -hmm. what I did not like, um, people would come, there would be a message on the fence, regardless of what the message was, but somebody would come with a sign and that person felt that his or her message was more important so than everybody and would them. slap it over somebody else's right. sign. That irritated me. So I would take it down and I would move it aside or you know put it somewhere else because everybody's message was mm -hmm. important, except the white nationalists, their message and the important. Jesus saves people. But yeah, yeah. But okay. except their messages, but everybody else's message was important to me. So I would make sure and move it so everybody's message was seen. So when the whole thing was plastered and they have very little pace to take a picture, you know, keep in mind the scaffolding's up in front of the White House to build the inaugural stage, which went up, I think, long before it was supposed to, but there's some discrepancy about that. Um, but uh, they were complaining that they couldn't see their daddy's house when they'd come in. So from the point of the first destruction, there were then three MAGA marches that culminated in the insurrection. We're not gonna take you through all those details because that's another class, but uh, <laughs> this is a particular sign that Nadine commissioned me to make. And sometimes what we do is she'd say make this and because we're there 24 7 because i'm shitting in a plastic bag and she's searching i'm sorry and she's searching for restrooms and we're sleeping on the street in chairs and and because everything's terrible and there's crazy people and i'm strapping a bulletproof vest on her half the time she'd say make the sign care and then i do something silly on it to make us laugh and we laughed a lot mm -hmm. so actually eliza took this in, into the uh and, and this was made because conference. while we are the yeah. fans, I would overhear the conversations about this is so ugly and this is so this and this is so, you know, all kind of stupid remarks, especially by all the people. And I'm saying to myself, the reason that this fence exists is because of people like you. Mm -hmm. And I'm fed up of hearing you bitch about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you would vote differently, we wouldn't have to be here because the police would be held accountable and they wouldn't just be murdering black right. people because, right. you know, so I don't want to hear it. Uh -huh. So that's why I said to put up that sign. I don't want to hear it. Kind of on listening to his point about all the people kind of reason that being here. That's kind of, kind of, um, it's very interesting because I feel like, we're in a very different society now. Like before when there was civil rights, before when um you had these public, public um sort of public public I want to say public protests like Main Man March and these different things. There weren't these different outlets of social media. And on, on top of that, like I feel like the big thing that the reason why there's so many people involved because there is somebody with a camera that can actually record and show mm -hmm. yes, there is a black man that is getting mm -hmm. getting choked for eight minutes and 46. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another black man who's being shot for just running these things. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that it does come down to, I don't want to say that it is the what that old people are at fault, but I think that we are in this sort of shift that young people need to get involved. Not just young people get involved, but old people have to abandon these sort of rooted control and colonial, if we're being very honest, rooted control and colonial mm -hmm. variables that direct people from getting involved in history. Because for me, I remember um I remember first when I came into when I came in Howard's program, I'm not gonna of course say the teacher, but I had a teacher who actually told me that black there was no black history in hip hop. But it was so interesting for me to say that because she didn't look at like your whole other. your whole thing. Oh yeah, and it was it was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting Is that a big F you to that teacher? I mean, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that at all because I appreciate it. Watch me no, like no 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 it does take that. Even and I feel like the thing about history is that it does take a common ground to be established on both sides to still get a story out there because right. at the end of the day you want support, you want exposure. Mm -hmm. So and um it was just interesting for me because seeing her 
um, of course, being older and not looking at me and absolving an entire history of people that yeah. doesn't make sense was just so, I don't know, it was just, it was kind of odd because it kind of reminded me of how that a lot of times we see now there are old people who don't acknowledge history as what we see today. Like there are probably some old person right now who's saying, how can the Black Lives Matter thing be history when it hasn't yeah, been exactly. here for 30 years? Exactly. It hasn't been. It's like, exactly. who needs to absolve somebody from talking about the history? Even when we look at all, um, because for me, I always use rapping as a focal point. So even when we look at documentaries, like um, there's a documentary on Prime Video that talks about um, Little Baby's Life. And he actually goes kind of in depth talking about how, of course, when the Amer when America, of course, got the Olympics, Atlanta got the Olympics and these things, it's like, okay, it's great. Oh, boom, boom, boom. But on the same side of that, due to Atlanta having the Olympics, there was a population of impoverished, disfranchised, disfranchised and um, racially oppressed people that had to relocate and never got proper housing again. We're forced to succumb to um, sort of conditions that the world doesn't know about. And it's like, mm -hmm. we, we see this, of course, example of the Olympics. Oh, this is when every country comes, this is when you're supposed to show the best of your country, but they were actually building walls to not show the poverty that they created. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it is very interesting that, um, you know, we have, we, we kind of see now that of course, we're kind of moving towards young people getting more involved because I really do think that is what it would take. It would oh, take another person and look at, of course, what are you doing um, as a distance? Because for me, um, my, I have a lot of friends who make clothes. But everything I have mm -hmm. right now is for my friends who make clothes. Um, so I'd be telling them sometimes that even them making clothes, that's resistance. You're making, a, mm -hmm. you're making mm -hmm. something that says mm -hmm. in racism. I have a friend um, who's very close to me who has a, a brand called Gratitude. It basically just talks about going through impoverished communities in Chicago and expressing gratitude. I have another friend who has a brand known as LHP, Legacy mm -hmm. History Pride. It, it shows the impact of HBCUs on Black culture. It shows the impact of the Black experience on culture. I have another friend who has a brand called Victimized Suspect, which talks about people of um, minorities, basically, being victimized suspects, which basically mm -hmm. means that we are both one in the same, but in the same term. Mm -hmm. And for some people, might not know what a victimized suspect is, but through his clothes, I still feel that that's still a form of resistance. Right, right. So with this big story, I just feel like it does take older people to realize that the world is changing and, and it, the world needs the world needs to truly change. Like we have a phone. Like yes. There wasn't FaceTime back then. There wasn't yes. Instagram. There wasn't TikTok. But yes. at the same time, TikTok is getting 40% of Google search engine traffic, which is in, a, in itself insane, but it right. does make you realize that okay, we do have to change our perspective, we have to change our prerogative, and we do have to be more inclusive. But this also goes back to the whole, um, the Trump supporters that want to tear it down because it's trash, because mm -hmm. it's graffiti, because you are messing up me being able to see my daddy's house, this is garbage, I need to tear it down and throw it on the ground. Mm -hmm. Apparently that's garbage. less garbage than hanging up garbage. But they yeah. do it because this isn't important because it doesn't affect me. And that's the whole colonialist mentality, that's the whole, you know, white people problem i think you know that's the whole white supremacy bucket of worms is if it's not about me if it doesn't affect me it's not real it doesn't matter and it won't be history and it's so interesting that too because i feel like there's a lot of colonial methodology with the way we perceive academia because like even for instance just going back to kind of hippo i i to this day argue a lot with teachers about where do you find the academic validity in hip-hop how do you mm -hmm. are able to put mm -hmm. something like that and say that there's actual something we'd be learning from well in actuality, when we see when we look at Young Doug's case, the court still uses the same lyrics to determine what happened right. to life. It's still politically, legally, and governmentally in the court. So if it can be in the court, why can't it be in right. the right. education system? Right. Because for me, let's we all go to of course being benefited by having education, having these different things. But for me, coming from North Carolina, I know people who don't know 16 history facts, but can give you 16 lines from 16 different songs. Right. And you're gonna say that. They don't have a history or there's not any knowledge from that that doesn't make sense and aren't there whole college courses on sex in the city <laughs> okay. thank you genius i'm sorry i'm trying to get to the rest of you guys stuff this is january 30 2021 and now for the sake of time i'm going to turn it over to eliza while you watch this soundless video okay so while you're watching this, the, the things that you're seeing here are is the st strategy we took for uh, taking down the fence. Um, basically, I, after um, a lot of very skittish conversations, being like, hi, I work in the Library of Congress. If you ever need help from an archivist, let me know. And then scooting off on my bike to go to work. Um, <laughs> and then coming back and being like, do you need anything? And scooting away again. Um, we, we finally, uh, Nadine and, um, uh, and the Black Lives Matter DC community um, agreed that the, 
the protest had served its purpose by January, like by mid January after um, after the insurrection mm -hmm. and after the uh, exactly and after the, after the inauguration, the purpose of um, preserving the fence wasn't the same. And um, also, it just happened that there was going to be a really nasty snowstorm on January 31st, mm -hmm. so which would have destroyed things irreparably. And mm -hmm. you'll see a photo in a minute that shows you what the out out outcome was. So mm -hmm. I said, all right, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right, or as right as we can make it. Um, let's get the biggest Ziploc bags we can possibly find, and mm -hmm. we're going to take things down basically to try to establish provenance. So we're gonna take things down by panel. And so what the outlines are, are like what the panels, we define them as. Um, and then that way each bag um, we made into um, basically as much as we could a panel per bag, but there were a couple panels that you'll see were huge. And so several panels per bag. So um, the numbers yeah. at the top? Yeah, the little- Eliza told us to put numbers at the top. We didn't know what we were doing. We just did what she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked okay. into the morning with into the morning, sleep, yeah. making no sure sleep. everything that had fallen off no. the fence before then, because it was a constant process of putting stuff back up on the fence, mm -hmm. because things fall off because of rain and sleet and snow mm -hmm. and, and wind and, 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 and crazy people. Tied on and statues. Yeah. And, right? Yeah. So uh, constant process, we always had a stack. And every time it rained, we'd dry the stuff on the dash dashboard of whoever's car we could get and then fix it and put it back up and so about two days before this we start a mad dash trying to recruit people to help put everything back up so that anything that had been there that hadn't gotten back up yet could be represented in the final incarnation of it and so you ready for me to keep going i think so okay. yeah you, you you get the kind of idea here and so the, the the hope the hope and dream the other part about this that was really hilarious was literally the friday before the saturday takedown i asked here and i was like oh what's the plan for like where's it going to go what's the transportation plan? we live in the moment <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, okay so we're we're like, crisis this. by crisis <laughs> control all i knew was today <laughs> so at 5 30 i get a car for an enterprise for a week i get the biggest suv they have available <laughs> That's step one. So now we have a vehicle to put everything into because we did not have that plan. Um, so, so the next day, you can see the snowstorm. It, it doesn't actually look so scary, but it was it was quite bad. If you were in the area, it was not a great day. Um, and we had six people total that helped us yeah. take everything off and put them into separate bags that were referenced by the number of the panel that they were on and on the iPhone drove. Drawn, drawn, drawn. <laughs> the little lines yeah. around which panels were in which thing and maybe this piece wasn't quite in that one yeah. and then all of it got loaded into eliza's tiny apartment <laughs> which you'll also get to see in a moment um, but before we go there the other piece about this that's really important to note is that nadine is a uh, media maiden Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and so on the day of the takedown, we also have reporters from the Washington Post there. Um, and this is a very important, very important. this is very important <laughs> piece because basically the rest of the story couldn't well, happen. Because if it doesn't happen yeah. in the media, it doesn't exist. Right. A little bit, but also the, the, <laughs> the, the, just the wonderful thing that comes out of this. But so before, before the takedown happens, at this point, I've already talked to the, um, the curator and showed her photos of the fence. She's identified pieces that we can take. The chief has approved that we're going to take a very small sample because these things are massive, cumbersome, and as you all have probably learned a little bit about, collection maintenance is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, it's really hard to take care of things that are large, that are fragile, that might have mold. All of these things were a big consideration, and on top of it, it is a pandemic, so we really weren't accessioning a whole lot of material, and that was something that came up for a lot of institutions, but we accepted um, 38 pieces total. And just as an addendum, yeah. Yeah. Howard. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. So yeah. I had been, I had someone calling around on my behalf to the institutions because we thought they would take it because they took from the first friend. So we thought they would take from this friend, but nobody was coming, nobody wanted it. But the person who had called, um, who had been calling around, she was, um, somebody suggested that she contact the DC Public Library. So she and I was in a call and we spoke to. What is um, I can't remember her name um, from the public library. Um, I think that you. We had the oral history. Yeah. Because they told us that they told us that they cannot take any physical pieces, You're but they do an oral they, history. Yeah. So that is how the the DC Public Library got involved. First became involved. Be, okay, well let me finish. Okay, sir. So <laughs> the, no, I just would need to finish it. So um, none of the institutions, the the museums, who we thought would take it, was interested in taking it. We spoke to DC Public Library, they said they'll do an oral um, history, but they kind of take any physical pieces. So then the inauguration happened, the, um, they let us back there the Friday the 22nd, and on the 24th is the day that I decided that I couldn't be there any longer, so this is coming up. 
And between the 24th and probably the 26th, a young lady who, um, who is a alumni of Howard University gave me the name of Dr. Um, Lopez, Lopez Matthews. Matthews. And I called him around possibly the 25th. And I asked, I told him that, you know, the defense was, we were bringing us the stuff down. And if they were interested, he said, yes. And that's how Howard University became involved in it. They sent someone who came during the takedown thing, right. which probably we had to do again oh, with the like, because mm -hmm. it made it also, we didn't even know Howard had 100 pieces until months later because it was all being taken down at the time and it was in such great bulk that well i'll go back real quick so you can look at the eliza's house yeah there you go so that nope. is, <laughs> <laughs> luckily no bug infestations happened <laughs> um, it was something i hadn't even thought about and so. she giggled like a maniacal child the entire time <laughs> She was so excited to have no way to walk in her house because all the pieces were cluttering it all up. And I really recognized only in that moment the extent of her nerdiness. <laughs> the reason for that glee, as you can probably imagine, is the fact that I was just so thrilled that everything was being saved. Mm -hmm. Neither Nadine or Karen had really figured out what the whole plan was going to be. And that's why no I was kind of like, I am nervous. No please, don't, please don't leave me. Like, don't leave me. <laughs> behind i'm here to help i promise um i'm not here to take anything i just really want to make sure this works out for everybody and um and so as we came through it was like okay we need storage unit we need a plan we need to figure out like what are going to be our next connections and um and so that's where and we'll come back to the cabernet in just a minute but that's where this wonderful man ed laney comes into play and going back to that washington post article so the washington post article comes out in the sunday edition which is great it means everybody is reading it in the metro section including ed delaney and it turns out Ed Delaney is um, the person who services um, or provides service to the scanner that's at Enoch Pratt. And he found me on, on LinkedIn because of the article said Eliza Loventhal Library of Congress. And luckily, my name is obscured up that nobody else has one. And you can figure out who I am. So he reached out on LinkedIn and said, hey, I know someone who might have a scanner that you could use. It's big enough. I think it would work. <laughs> and gave me Jimmy's email address. <laughs> Period. But then, then walked away, and, and, and that's the end of Ed's story. And so, <laughs> and so I, I checked in with Nadine and Karen, and I said, hey, I, he I heard that there's a scanner that we could pass on that email. <laughs> <laughs> It, can I can I can I follow up? Are we good with me following up? And so I emailed Jody. I'm like, hello, you don't know me. Nice to meet you. Um, I heard that you might have a scanner and might be willing to, <laughs> to scan things. And and she said, well, let's have a conversation because uh, Digital Maryland. And I'll, I'll ask for you, for you to chime in just a second for that. Um, but so then I said, okay, well, if we're gonna have a meeting. We need to have it be a group meeting. It can't be. I, I can't be the representative here. And so then we have this meeting. So that meeting was, and uh, I'm losing dates, April of- Nadine uh, and I were both on Zoom? Yeah, what was it on called? Zoom, on Zoom, Zoom and we were somewhere outside. in Virginia in the woods at, yeah. a, at somebody's house. I'm just gonna interject. Oh yeah, we are very close. So there sorry. might be some folks who need to run at an hour, but well, let's- Can we go over? Time. Is that okay? And if you need to bounce, that's okay. And uh, we'll something. get any of the questions from the chat. All right. Okay. All right. We'll be so fast. Yeah. Uh, so we had this uh, initial conversation where they were talking about, you know, what the project was. Um, I first was like, what do you want to see? What is the goal here? And it was, we want all of the signs to live together, um, you know, online somewhere, like somewhere people can see them all. And I think the initial number I was given was there might be like 350 signs, and then it was like 700 signs. Like, we started with 780. Yeah. Right? We, started, we started high, but it's so. <laughs> and and um, so I was like, I don't, I don't know exactly how we're going to do it. I was like, I don't know if I can make it a digital Maryland project. Because um, it's technically DC. Because technically DC. Also, there's a lot of stuff. Also, we're still coming out of lockdown. Mm -hmm. we're, but um, I think that I can wrangle scanning it for you. I, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do with those scans. Um, and, and, and we responded yeah. with. Oh, and my favorite part of that whole conversation <laughs> was Karen was like, well, wait a second. How much does this cost? 
And I was like, oh, it's free because Digital Maryland is sponsored by a state grant from the state of Maryland. So this is literally your tax dollars at work. Um, and so our charge is to scan and provide access things that relate to the history and culture of Maryland, which is a pretty broad charge. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say this relates. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then this happened. No, well, when Eliza first contacted Karen and me about it, I am thinking to myself, I didn't say anything to her, but I'm thinking to myself, we don't I have, have any money. money. <laughs> so I don't know what Karen was thinking. I was thinking but I'm going to listen, but people. I don't have any money to pay for it. I don't know how <laughs> we're going to scan 700, pay for, to scan 700. I mean, neither of us had worked for four months. We've <laughs> taken everything, like anything I was getting from New York, I was I was buying, like, I mean, it, it was bad. We had dug holes during the apocalypse, right. and we didn't know where any of this stuff was going. And I'm sorry, this is so stupid. And then we had this. And she said, it's free. <laughs> and it just, oh my God. You knew, I'm like, you knew there was a reason we just did this in this long. And the, the, the reason why we need to tell this part of the story, and I am so sorry that it's taken, uh, it, it, it's like three years of it's a love story. It's a long, it is a long story. But the reason that this connection chart is so critical is because it was all serendipitous. Yes. Because from there, we were yes. like, okay, we, like, I, like I can't, I'm at the Library of Congress, I can't tell any other institution to do anything. Oh, wow, free, free scanning, but we don't have a place to host it. And then we were like, okay, well, brainstorming, where do we go from here? We need a home for it. And we mentioned that uh, Nadine has an oral history over at DC Public Library, and Jody says, I'm sure DC Public is DC. <laughs> and so, cold calls. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I think it was something you said that was like, this is such, this is also like a quintessential DC collection because there's so much about specific DC politicians, mm -hmm. DC Metro Police, like, and so I was like, all right, well, let me reach out because, you know, maybe what one institution can't do by themselves, maybe we can figure out how to do this together. <laughs> Um, because we're gonna need some help. And I think right. the beauty of it is people just kept saying yes and then figuring it out. And I mean, that's what I did the whole time we were there. That's when they deemed it. Everybody just went, yes, and then we figured it out as we went. And it's very, I mean, I think it's very rare to have that many people that are that invested in something that they're willing to just go, yep, and figure it out. So then the lower comes. So in. yeah, now I would like to say I was originally, I saw the original email complaint. I was originally told around 900 items. <laughs> I'll just also mention it's really hard to sometimes assess the size of the collection. Um, <laughs> I'm going to continue to dibble in uh, our whole theory and knowledge here. Um, it can be really hard to tell that, especially when things are connected in long strands. Mm -hmm. So, many or of the front yeah. and back. I think we found, we found some very sneaky verses. Mm -hmm. um, um, <laughs> so, I'll just run through. And, uh, first so of all, the Dean drove. Every time, every what six weeks, every time he went through a batch, Nadine yeah. would drive to Baltimore again yeah. uh, on her own gas money and drop off that and take this back to a storage unit, which we started finding people besides Eliza to pay for. And you know, <laughs> everything's just always been touch and go. But this is uh, the first time delivered. So I kind of forget the order of these so mm -hmm. you can flip through. But so we were again, so Nadine was bringing us signs once we agreed to scan them. Um, and I think we scanned the first batch without the agreement with DC Public, so I still wasn't quite sure what we were going to do, but I was like, we're going to scan them. <laughs> um, and um, I'll show you what your pictures so, are, and then you yeah, can yeah. make a decision. Right. Wait, so, right sorry. Um, so we were dropping them off with like Nadine bringing them up, and of course, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, right? So like Nadine isn't allowed to come into the library. Mm -hmm. We are meeting in the, in the loading dock of the library because she can't come inside. And we're like trading things really fast. Mm -hmm. So I'm unloading a batch. We're shoving another batch uh, back in the car. Um, there's a photo of like Nadine being interviewed by like our crap marketing folks, like in the loading dock. <laughs> and, and the front library is beautiful. <laughs> 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 it was probably a year into this process.
that's before needing even like foot in, in the, the building. Yeah. Um, and so then the only other thing that I want to add to this, and we can talk about okay. some of the particulars mm -hmm. of like our agreement with BC public. I'm oh, sorry, public Joe, have you finished scanning everything yet? The other thing that I did not really take into account when we started on this process and all of you uh, archivists and librarians are going to do better than me, but um, these sites hung outside, right? So they have a fine grit on them, right? As soon as you touch them, they have tape, they have um, zip ties, they are crinkly, they are not flat. And when you work with big scanners, uh, most of them are a big flatbed with glass, right? Guess what's not covered under those service warranty? The glass. Guess what will scratch the glass? All of that grit, right? <laughs> So the only way we were actually able to do this uh, was with the big scanner. And like all of this stuff, you know, in talking to Nadine, this is somebody's story. This was like hugely important to the person that put it on the fence. So my job was also to honor that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And then you skip to the big scanner. So this scanner, uh, and I sent the link to Ed, he might be on. Um, <laughs> so it scans that whole scanning bed. We can scan three feet by six feet. It moves through the scanner and the scanner head is in the arch. So the nothing touches the item. So it's meant to scan art or protest signs <laughs> that you can it's their new marketing put up against the right? yeah. so, um, so it's slower than using a flatbed, but um, it allowed us to get the scans that otherwise it would have been materials that with a collection that large, you can't go through and like peel off all the tape or like otherwise stabilize. Zip ties, <laughs> zip ties, lots of zip ties. So then, um, and I don't know. Well, I'm sorry, this both. is also, this is an, um, yeah. This is a sample of like a piece that like was up in the very first fence, right? Did we find on the first fence? It started fence? on the first fence. It started fence. on the first fence, was recovered after thrown down, went up, was destroyed in the first destruction, went up, was ripped in the first MAGA march, uh, came down, was fixed, went back up. So all of these things, you know, obviously uh, everything was tried to be put back together and some of the materials they ended up with were <laughs> sad, it was exciting. sad versions of their former so, selves. Uh, we'll cut this real short, but um, although I just uh, yeah. so our agreement with DC Public, we went back and forth uh, quite a bit. But our agreement with DC Public ended up being uh, Enoch Pratt, Digital Maryland would do the scanning and provide some initial metadata. Um, DC Public would do some more uh, substantial metadata. We would share that information between our two institutions. And with uh, Karen Eliza and Nadine, right? So a full set goes to them as well. That was an important part. Um, and I won't go into details, but having two very old, large institutions agree to a thing <laughs> that requires substantial time when neither one of us were actually taking possession of the physical collection, uh -huh. um, that's a big deal. It took a lot of explaining <laughs> and re-explaining and then some more explaining. So I'm, is it okay if I jump all the way to Laura and then yeah, the backtrack if they let us talk anymore? Wait, wait, there you are. Oh, there you are. Wait, is that you? No, that's Eliza. That's you. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is just, I'm sorry, I'm recovering from COVID, so I'm a little hoarse. I apologize. Um, well, what we see here is after Jody's amazing team did the scanning, they transferred all the files to us through Box, which is a lot like Dropbox. And from there, we um, immediately downloaded the files, we backed them up, created checksums, we accessioned them. Um, and then I also have this massive, massive spreadsheet. I said this earlier, if you don't like spreadsheets, this is the wrong profession for you. <laughs> um, we have this massive, I have this massive tracking spreadsheet that tells me the who, what, and when of the metadata. 
So it's all the individual items metadata, but it's also who's working on what item. Um, I use color coding to tell me where it is in the process as far as being checked and ready to go. And then it has the date of when it's ready to go into Dig DC. And Dig DC is um, our equivalent of Digital Maryland. It's our digital collection. It's where all these items, as well as the 38 items from the Library of Congress, are going to be in just a few weeks. And it's also going to link out to Howard's collection. So it'll be a one-stop place they can go to get all of the um, Black Lives Matter um, Memorial Fund's artifact collection. Oh, just uh, describe the bonus. Is that in there? Yeah, we're going to get there. Um, so this was all about the metadata. <laughs> um, very exciting. So uh, the goal of the metadata first is to create a human readable version and then a machine readable version. So the first version is um, we use Dublin Core, which is a very flexible 15 element metadata schema. Um, this is great because because of its flexibility, you can use it to describe a button, a t-shirt, um, a poster, and um, it also is made up of fields that are repeatable and optional, optional and um, some required. So a required field might be the title or the description. Um, an optional field might be the creator or um, a notes field. So that's human readable in a spreadsheet. From there, we want to migrate it into something that is machine readable. So I take that um, Dublin Core metadata in a CSV file, put it into Open Refine, and um, use, use some templating to then make it a mods XML file, which is then machine readable. It takes that metadata, it wraps an XML tag around it, now a computer can read it. So we take that machine readable mods metadata form and the original image file, ingest them together into Dig DC, and that creates a digital object, which is both machine readable and human readable. Okay, so this is just a quick, you can see step one here at the top, CSV, human readable. Step two, which is very blurry, um, that, those are the XML tags, so now it can, a computer can read it. Step three, this is what it looks like in Dig DC, both human and machine readable. Wow. So there were three different groups of people with two different responsibility levels that were working on creating the metadata for this project. So the first responsibility level, those were um, DCPL librarians and a couple students from UNZ um, who worked with us on a previous metadata project. So those people were all um, responsible for creating all of the metadata. So that means the title, the description. Um, they also assigned Library of Congress subject headings. They worked in batches of 10 to 40 artifacts with a two week deadline, depending on how much they had, how much time they had. Um, and they had access to Box, viewer only, they couldn't download those files. And they worked in Google Sheets. The other group were members of the public. Um, we had about 35 people total that participated in events that we call Describe-a-thons. Um, we had two of them, they were super fun. We were very, very lucky to have Nadine and Eliza at both of them, Karen came to one of them. Um, and it's, it's great. We, the format for that was a little intro, like what you got today, and then a training on the basics of metadata and the work time. They could ask Nadine and Eliza and Karen questions. They could talk about what they were seeing. And so their responsibility for the metadata was a little light, a little more lightweight. Um, things like the title, the description, notes, and then later I would go back and add the subject headings and kind of do a little bit of cleanup work. Um, but it was, I'm just so grateful that so many members of the public were able to contribute to this collection. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, now, you not seeing the actual physical pieces and only the scans, how do you include what the material is in the metadata with any level of confidence? Yeah, um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that's why it's really helpful to be able to have maybe an Eliza and you. People have touched it before. Yep, because yep, you guys know so much about the items. Um, it's learning, too. Is like, this something we're going to be able to add to for like the next 20 years? Yeah. And the other, the other part about it is um, yeah. the, the scans are so high resolution that it's very easy to see that that is definitely mm -hmm. car oh, corrugated car cardboard versus 
poster board versus a sheet of paper. Like it, it was, it was quite. They're quite okay. high resolution. <laughs> you will have a great Though time there's making some them your weird background stuff that we're not there. <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. And you, sometimes you do your best to try to to try to describe it. Um, it's, it, it can be difficult. Okay. Uh, so okay. so um, how how it gets into this is when. Um, Judy was working with the Library of Congress, with Eliza of the Library of Congress, and then they pulled in DC Public Library. And then I said, well, if the three institutions are working together, then Howard University has um, yeah, for the science, let's get them on board too. So everything, the whole comprehensive collection could be together. And that is how Howard University was mm -hmm. uh, introduced. So I guess I'll elaborate on that a little bit more, but um, so I came in uh, first year of grad school, was working under Ms. Lewis Williams, and she immediately asked me, did I want to work with this project with Black Lives Matter? Um, for me, I I was extremely excited um, because for me, kind of viewing that space, um, it was always interesting to see how many different avenues people use for resistance. Like I have um, this um, leader in D.C. named Raheem B. who um, works a lot with the Freedom Fighters, just kind of I was following kind of him on the ground, seeing what he was doing there. And it was to kind of be able to actually work with these materials was something that was very um, invigorating for me. Only because like, I feel like a lot of times that people, especially people my age, due to the fact that I'm only 23, um, there aren't a lot of times when I see a lot of people my age truly get involved, let alone get involved with trying to archive the story. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, um, of course, being able to take part in the story from Dr. Lopez Matthews taking the initiative to even digitize it and then even Ms. Lewis Will Williams um, blessing me with the task of doing it. It was very, it was a very eye-opening experience. Some of the um, materials I saw really just, I kind of had to sit back and think like, wow, like, where did you pull this from your mind and really use this as a form of protest art? And then on top of that, with, how is this not considered history? Because a lot of times I feel, I was still very, very young in my program. So like, uh, it would be a lot of things that I would be like, teachers, this history, this history. And it would be such a sort of a, I don't want to say academic remission, but it wasn't really a lot of academic rec recognition to it. And so being able to actually be a part of bringing academic recognition to it was something that was very, you know, like I said before, invigorating. So some of the images. Um, oh, do you want me to go back? Oh, yeah. I, I kind of chose some of these images because they were, the images that I felt kind of just were able to. And two of those Nadine made. I was there a lot. <laughs> Actually, three of them, I guess. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so some of the images for me just kind of, because the big thing for me looking at the Black Lives Matter archive was that, because it really is an archive, was realizing that this is not just a fence. This is not just a public demonstration. This is history we're watching. This might not be coming from a book. It might not be coming from a 50 year old white man who has four degrees from a PWI, but this is actually like <laughs> a actual, you know, this is this is somebody's history. And so it was just very, it was, it, it kind of showed me a little bit more how the field of history, it needs to be more inclusive. I feel like we always talk about these different things that unite us as people, but when it comes to everything, history is at the root. When you want to buy a property, you're going to look at the history of that community where you're buying the property. If you want to be an economist and go work for somebody's fund, you're going to look at the history. How much money did they make? What were their returns? What were their dividends? Things like that. So um, for me, doing the collections kind of made me realize even more that history does take a lot of different forms and there are a lot of different ways to get involved with history. So being able to be a part of this unilateral effort with the DCPO, Warrior Goddess, and of course, this kid was just very invigorating. And um, it kind of showed me through my periods, it's just like, because even um, I would come talk to my friends, like, what are you working on? I'm like, I'm Black Lives Matter. It's like, Black Lives Matter. What do you mean? It's like, you, you, you can get a part of it too. So it's like, it was, um, it was very, it was, it was a very enriching experience for me. And it kind of showed me that history takes many forms, the archive takes many forms, but in order for these forms to be acknowledged, there has to be recognition no matter right. academic social mm -hmm. political but every single every there's an archive everywhere there's mm -hmm. a archives are made daily exactly. <laughs> <laughs> archives are made daily. so um, really just kind of emphasize that and on top of that um one thing that kind of was interesting to me is that i come from Raleigh, north carolina southeast Raleigh. so right now we see a lot of things with the bills as far as like critical race theory where we're actually watching mm -hmm. My the experience of my people, the people who look like me, actually be outlawed, yes. literally yes. traced. Yes. And it's so interesting because, um, of course, as I'm going through these classes, I actually learned about this recently. Like there was actually something known as the Lost Cause, in which, um, the U, it was the UDC, which is the United Arts of Confederacy, 
and the UCB, which was the United Confederate Veterans, actually were able to work with the government to create a whitewashed version of history to support um, Confederate soldiers as the, not only the peak of masculinity, but this history that Confederacy was actually just, Confederacy deserves active recognition. And it actually, it actually, it gained a lot of leeway during the 20th century. And that was 20th century, that's a very, very long time ago. So to kind of see <laughs> that sort of thing, not maybe in the, in the way as laws call those different things with Confederacy, but kind of see that same sort of action happen now um, was even one of the, was kind of even more of a, identify that, yes, I do need to work with this history. Yes, I do need to work with Black Lives Matter because if Black Lives Matter started as a fence, maybe in 20 years, there'll be a documentary, maybe there'll be an organization mm -hmm. that you feel like we'll be able to do this unilateral effort and do a lot more for our community. So mm -hmm. that was one. All right, this is some stuff I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, is, is this? So, yeah, so th these are two representations of, of what you can, will be, what we will be able to see online with DigiC and what the current um, uh, online uh, access is for the Library of Congress's um, collection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just to talk a little bit more about that metadata component, that access <laughs> component, um, to give you a sense of, like, we were talking just a minute ago, Judy was describing how hard these things were to scan, how difficult they were to handle. Judy has had to work with these things that were changing. The, the signs that you saw, it's very like, hard to get. This right here, that right there is a shield this big and curved. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an actual, you know. These are definitely three-dimensional objects. Uh -huh. So the, the reason for going from Judy's slide to this is very specifically to call out, it's in, incredibly difficult in a digital environment to see what um, the dimensions are. You can read the dimensions all day long and you can try to picture that in your mind, but part of this is understanding that these things are really massive. And so Karen, if you'll go back a few slides toward mm -hmm. the um, uh, Iser, uh, uh, one, one more back, mm -hmm. or two more back, sorry. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, sorry, there we are. That, yeah, yeah, this is just to give you an example. Uh, coming into the Library of Congress, um, the world is watching. So this had to go, uh, all of the things for the Black Lives Matter um, collection that we have at, at the library went through our Matus, which is a very similar device, except it's a, a, a six foot by four foot flatbed that has a hovering arm that goes over it. So again, no glasses involved because it would be damaged <laughs> immediately. Um, and so just to have, help understand scope, because now when you see this image over here in the catalog, there's no way to understand that. There's just no way to understand this thing is the the breadth the width, the width, the width of my arms span? Sorry, that was harder to say than I thought. I'm getting excited, and so that, I think that's a, that, like that's also another piece of it. And Junie, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about how the description work went for you, trying to trying to capture these yeah. things that were both symbolism as well as strong like like written messaging. There's layers there. So honestly, it kind of took a little bit of just being introspective because I feel like, especially like with my major, I feel like there's for history to be a field of people who are talking about something that they didn't experience there's so much um i don't know everybody i don't want to say stroke of ego but there's no way y'all always think you're right you weren't you weren't in the <laughs> and so um, that being said for me you kind of take i kind of had to sit down and just think of because there would be times where like i would call i would walk, talk to my boss or i would talk to my coworkers, like how does this how does like what do you feel when you look at this because um, I think the, pro the thing about history is that it comes from all different facets. Just because you remember it some way doesn't mean that's how somebody else remembered it. And definitely just because you felt about it this way, there's a whole another side of feelings that are not being analyzed or taken into account with the archives. So when it came to um, writing these um, some of these descriptions, I really had to sit down, do a little bit of research, but kind of do a little bit of soul searching and feel like, how does this make me feel? Or how would this make my mother feel? Or how would this make my little brother feel? Or where, do, where, do, where have I seen this? happened before and with that introspection it kind of just kind of it made me realize that when it comes to resistance when it comes to being an archivist when it comes to engaging in the field of actually reporting history and not reporting a colonial one-sided view you have to be introspective you have to be willing to go beyond what's beyond go beyond the go beyond the papers go beyond the text go beyond just what you what you're writing and one of the things that was interesting to me is that this project actually involves digital history. A lot of times, what I see um, just being so young in the, in the field of history is that when it comes to involving technology, involving digital history, there's always sort of like a, oh, I don't really want to do that. It's a very touchy feeling subject, but yeah. seeing, being able to take some of these images and make a description of history that was already established and also some of my own, of course, opinions and also being able to 
combine digital elements as far as like the skin and the metadata and all these different things to XML. It just it kind of it just kind of added to the description. Also being a Howard student, which and being able to see all the different, of course, demonstrations of student activism and things like that. It was very, it, it was it was a very insightful experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that in order for me to have properly been able to do descriptions, I really did have to sit down and just not look at it like, okay, well, I, I saw this, with, I saw this for five minutes. This says Black Lives Matter. Okay, we're gonna write Black Lives Matter. Okay, wait, there's an American flag, there's an American flag behind Black Lives Matter. Or there's a picture of a man holding an American flag and he's sad. Why is that? Because as Black people, we're always taught and we're always in these positions where we're being the leaders of these billion dollar industries that represent America, but our own country doesn't give us that same respect. And so um, it was it was very, like I said, it was very introspective. It was very, um, it was very insightful. And in order for me to do this description, I really had to kind of dig into myself and dig into my community to make sure I was properly adhering to the people that actually created this. Yeah. I would just like to throw in that, that when you're white people that are trying to come into a space and you know that it's not necessarily the frame of reference that is your history in particular, the one of the amazing things about the fence for me was that it was everything. It was because everything that affects all of us affects black lives more exactly. and worse exactly. and first and harder, exactly. right? So that it's all the same fight thing is what I kept coming from, mm -hmm. but also recognizing it's not, this isn't, this isn't for me, right? And I think Eliza also experienced this, that in order to, uh, in order to do that, we have to be able to um, invest and take risks without expecting something in return. And I think that is so uncommon so far that it makes communities hesitant to be like, oh, white organization wants to come take up a collection. And that it was very nice that Eliza, a little at a time, kind of wormed her way in. <laughs> and that as Eliza the human, and then became Eliza the LOC rep, way after Eliza the human was already invested. Exactly. So it made the transition possible. Yeah, but I had to convince the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter um, community, community, the head of the Black Lives Matter DC at the time, she let the collection go to um, the Library of Congress because she did not want it to go to any white institution because she felt that they usually take your stuff and then put it away somewhere mm -hmm. just to say they have it, but nobody would see it. Which is apparently what they do, not you, but now we're dealing with something. Else. Well, I, I convinced her. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. But I convinced her that it going to the Library of Congress was a good thing for the collection mm -hmm. in the end because. Of everywhere for it to be, people go to the Library of Congress and they're going to see that Black Lives Matter existed in 2020, and this is some of the stuff, and that would lead them to go find out about the rest. Mm -hmm. Also, like one big thing that um just kind of to elaborate on Ms. Nadine's point, your point is that the biggest thing about this that I thought was a big thing was the community get involved. I feel like a lot of times with history, especially like when you watch certain history shows or even watch the way certain things are covered, there's not a community engagement with history, and um even Beyond that, one of them, uh, one of the people I look up to who I actually had a class with, Miss Elizabeth Clark Lewis, she established public history at Howard. And so with that is basically the idea of actually creating environments of history and creating, just interacting with the public, but basically doing the public administration of history and things like that. And so for me, I just feel like it that has to be practiced. I feel like we, I don't know, it's, I kind of go back to my first point. It's like, we, the history field is just full of a lot of academics who academically omit a lot of stories because they're not talking to these people. Like even the fact that mm -hmm. people are talking to them is they didn't actually like what happened with the Black Lives Matter principle. There are people that will literally go to a specific society of people not do anything and then come back and get it. And they already perspective. think they, they know the answer. Africa. They exactly. already think they know the story. Exactly. They're just looking for things to fill in what they think they already know. Exactly. That's what journalists do a lot of times. Exactly. exactly. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and to the point again, can I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep bringing this back to our mm -hmm. community of components that the <laughs> Uh, the community archive capacity is something that is a wonderful and beautiful movement. And the problem that really comes with it, though, is not having the resources. Mm -hmm. And so that's where this was. This was beyond a personal charge for me. It was. It, it was this incredible. I could every day I would wake up and be like, I got to get back down there. I got to make sure that they're 
they've got someone to support them that they're that this isn't going to just go away that they know that there are places and there are people that can help them because one it wasn't a community that you guys had access to before and so that's that's a piece of it is that the one i wanted to break that barrier down and say this is a place that our she did our laundry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and it's not to say that everyone needs to do the laundry of any community that you're in. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. Um, she became a part of the community, not someone coming to seek to take something from exactly. for her own benefit. She was invested wholly and she was taking the same risks. She was taking the same in investment in that particular time frame. And so that's the piece of it is that when you see something that you see an archive being made, help them. Don't <laughs> don't take it from them. Don't direct them. Don't tell them what to do. Even if it's just telling them to put numbers up on a fence, like that's that's okay. You can help them there. But for, <laughs> once they say that they already want to collect it, but like, it's it's about cultivating that together rather than saying, okay, you can sit down. I know what to do now. I've mm -hmm. got the library science degree. I'm ready right. to help. And instead, right. it really is a conversation of like, what are you trying Because it, it, a huge part of it was like, what are you guys trying to do? Do you want this, mm -hmm. this to be safe? Is this ephemeral? And that is the domain instantiation. Or is this something that does need to be integrated into all of these institutions because it should not live in one place? And that was another piece for Karen and Nadine. They didn't want it to go to one place. Mm -hmm. Because that the, the problem with the fence to begin with was that it was only one spot. Uh, no, people were traveling from all over the world to come to DC still, and they were coming to that fence. They were coming, and there were at least 15 to 20 languages on the fence at one point, which is a sign that it was not, it, it became a, 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 as a, an icon for people to come to and to, to express their frustrations or uh, concerns or solidarity. Uh, yeah, solidarity, joy, all of the components. Um, but that's the main thing I'd like you all to take away here. Is yes. That, oh, oh, sorry. This is storage. Well, that's yes. awesome. This is where the question is now. <laughs> this is where the question is now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Acquired by the Library of Congress. <laughs> this, is, this is art in living in living color. <laughs> 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 this is in your fire sign. You see the sign. I hate that much longer. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's all about the media. Just stop. And, well, US media, but not French media. French media, <laughs> not the, <laughs> French media. You see that? Nice, yes. nice. Yes. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Black Lives Matter Memorial Fence Museum. We'll have people come and do tours yes. in here. So wait, I'm gonna wait, here we go. Nadine has curated this entire museum, and this is the first time I've seen it. It was all just in bags. Most of it is still in bags. <laughs> wait, I think it's the other side of that don't boo vote, boo and vote. Did you see the other side? Oh, I think it's the other side. Hang on. It's not about voting. It says. Ah, see, this is why we have to 3D scan it to know that whoever created the first one also created the second one. Right, and I remember, can I turn it around? I mean, this is nice color, but I remember when, before the election, we were leaving up some stuff in the center, right? That was like boat stuff, uh, not the media center, but closer to the center. And one of the processes was always that uh, we would take things that were vote related and whatnot and move to the outskirts for mm -hmm. things that were not related, related to specifically black lives or political things or stuff like that would go to the ends. So I remember taking this off and being like, okay, we gotta move this down and turning it over and being like, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually my restore. Okay. That's all. <laughs> The black marker. <laughs> the whole thing. What were her tool side that took okay. right? Yeah. Awesome. That's so <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, so this is what I do. What do you want? Totally still bright, probably. Yeah. Start off with fuck ice and then just got a Stephen Miller. I don't know that that wasn't necessarily put it on there because it was M ice. Right. I don't know, but because I know I I I spoke to the person who created that Stephen Miller thing. Yeah. So I I remember being there talking to the person and the person that handed out stickers asking um someone who was there a young man who was there Samuel I think is his name to um put stickers around DC and the person ended up sticking one on the fence but I don't know if she chose this specifically because of that but if if not there was space and it doesn't detract from the initial oh, messaging so generally speaking like so long as it's not something that's out of place when somebody collects it's just an artist artistic collaboration <laughs> <laughs> A scandal was another out of the room. Right, exactly. Well, that's Stephen Miller, Satan. Yeah. Nobody has that <laughs> spirit. Exactly. I'm going to say for a too, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Sorry, I want to show you that because we witnessed your class, and if anybody in the future does any special collections, you don't know where that stuff's going yet. It's all in a storage unit that we can't afford to pay. So if anybody <laughs> has any interest. <laughs> the storage is the only Okay, sorry. Okay. So layered, there's no way. There's so many it. versions there's of the no story. way to tell it in an hour. And like you were we saying, tried. we tried to focus on our audience, but unfortunately, we have so many people yeah. from so many different perspectives. It's hard to just, you know. Well, that is okay. I think um, we are still going to maybe make some room for questions that came through in the chat again. Um, and I think we're going to be if you have any questions for any of our smarty pants here um there's their email addresses right you can if you have any like specific super in-depth questions that i want to understand feel free to email them because they like to share the wealth, their wealth of knowledge right or they wouldn't have put their email addresses up like nadine and i did <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> yes. Um, um, I am on social media. Um, the black uh, on on Facebook. Instagram in, mm. on Instagram and Facebook is the Black Lives the Black Lives Matter Memorial. Fest. You can find us on Facebook and oh, on Instagram. Okay. I um I'll give you my email address. Uh, what is it? <laughs> oh, it's Karen D. Irwin. D is in dog, though that's not my middle name. Karen D. Irwin, I R W I N at gmail.com. All right, do we have any questions or comments from in the room, Anna? Thank you so much. Do you have a microphone? Oh, we're all by mic. Okay, it's in the Thank you. Um, built up by the talk. All of you um, are just so rich in experience and knowledge. Thank you also for addressing the disconnect between professional practice and community lived experience. I was questioning myself the whole time. I was like, there was no tension and they didn't fear co optation, but you got to that and you described it so beautifully. Anyway, thank you for your time. I could go on and on. Um, so my question is for Nadine and maybe June, you can answer too. Um, there were hints that you have Black diasporic heritage, maybe Afro-Caribbean heritage. Yes. And then I saw it confirmed with the Canadian flag. <laughs> the current board, the current board that put on the fence. So um, I didn't think to do it. <laughs> what we don't talk a lot about is the variance across Black identity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's treated as a monocultural marvel, right? So I'm especially pleased to see your representation as um, Afro-Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so I guess uh, and you hinted at this when you said two Black people initiated that evangelical mayhem. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how did you negotiate that? Um, we know that the leaders of Black Lives Matter, which is colored and I forget the names, but they're so intrepid, right? They themselves have Black diaspora heritage. That's lost a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And then Fatim Jean and Amadou Diallo, they themselves are Black immigrants. 
So I guess my question to you, and maybe Jim, if this applies, is how do you negotiate your intersectionality as being Black here, but Black from abroad? And were there ever any tensions? <laughs> and my second question is, what is your relationship with like capital Black Lives Matter? I know you talked about your local Black Lives Matter um, connections, and you didn't want it to go to a white institution. Did you have to answer to like the Patrices and the rest of them? Um, so what was the relationship there? Very packed, I know, but thank you in advance. Well, there is tension. There was tension and there is tension mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people view it that I am a foreigner and why would I be the face of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. um, Memorial Fest? And I just accidentally came into it. There was nobody else tending to it. The, the pieces were falling off and being strewn on the sidewalk and I was there because I wasn't working because of COVID and I just started picking it up and I just stayed. Uh, other people were there, but nobody stayed the length of time that I stayed. And I ended up being there. And there was tension because the younger people felt, who basically, who is this foreigner and why does, you know. So, um, and they felt that too much stuff was on the fence that wasn't Black liberation. And I had to explain to them, especially, and I explained to the person from Black Lives Matter DC that. I came there before the fence was there. So I came there because of the former guy. And I am black, I'm female, I am immigrant, I'm over 40, and I'm also an atheist. So I have so much intersectionality. So not just one thing. I'm not just interested in black people being murdered. I'm a feminist, I am you know a, a, a non-believer. So I have so much different things. So it all has to be represented here because. I'm not the only person who has all these different inter intersectional stuff. So the problem was deciding what to give preference to on the fence. So when um, Black Lives Matter said they, want, they didn't want him centered on the fence, I agreed, but I told her that that is what brought me there. I'm there for the fence and that's what brought me there. So it, it doesn't have to be taken off in total, but I will make the center Black Lives Matter focus. So we moved everything else to the side. And if you watch the middle of the fence, like the probably eight or 10 columns, it's all Black Lives Matter. And then the anti, um, anti the other guy and the feminist stuff and the climate change stuff was put to the side. So that was an agreement I made with them. But at some point they did come, the community did come and start tearing stuff off of the fence because they said that there wasn't black liberation. Mm -hmm. And if it had Kamala Harris on it, they would tear it off because she used to be a cop. So they also told the sign that said, um, um, somebody who was not in our community, who was not in my community, he came and he tore the fence, he tore off the sign that said, if um, you have a problem with the fence, take it up with Trump because he was doing it on behalf of the black community. And I said to him, you're not respecting the black community because I'm a black woman and I'm the reason why that was there. So you don't just come and you just decide what's black liberation and what could be on this fence. So there was tension between um, the black liberation part of BLM and me with what could stay on the fence. Mm -hmm. And I said, you all are not here, you all are not sleeping here. Three, um, three, you all haven't slept here for three months. You all haven't been here for like five hours. You all would come, do your protest, and then leave. We stayed here for three months. So I feel I have precedent of determining what can stay and what can't stay. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, I do not have any um, affiliation with the Black Lives Matter National. They don't know I exist. I know them only from the um, newspapers. Um, Black Lives Matter DC um, actually paid for this banner that's in the back there. Because when I um, asked, said I wanted to make a banner that said Black Lives Matter DC, she said that she would pay for it. So um, I did have support from the local um, chapter, but nothing to do with the national. I've never heard from anybody in the national. Um, Thank you. Um, also, just to kind of go off Amy's point about kind of her thing about being a representation for the Black Lives Matter community, but still not being acknowledged. I think it also, I think it really boils down to the root basis of how Black people view themselves in a way. Because um, for me, um, my beautiful mother actually was able to allow me to go to Africa and spend 
months there multiple times and just being out there and then also coming back to a southern state that also has its own perspective of Africa that they've never seen you do see sort of the colonial methodologies that are in, that are rooted in a lot of the ways we think and so I do think that when it comes time to deal with of course Black Lives Matter when it comes time to deal with the holistic struggle we do need to remember that this is a holistic struggle um there are people in Africa who still do the, who still are revolutionizing their own methods of ways to combat certain things but even though there's no that's not televised that doesn't mean it's not happening and so um I think really when it comes down to of course dealing with Black Lives Matter and also being having a more unified archive I think it comes down to abandoning the hope abandoning the wrong ideology that we're not all in this together yes we all are in this schedule and we also came from a lot of the same places you just don't want to acknowledge it. And so it really just gets down to that point where I feel that it comes down to being open while also trying to educate yourself on what you are talking about. Because I feel like a lot of times, a lot of people follow a wave in America and they yeah. tend to try trying to act a certain way because somebody else is doing it. But the reality is nobody read anything except what's being talked about on Twitter. And so, um, <laughs> and so um, it really just comes down to, I think the big things, when they come down to is comprehension and then also immersion, like immersing yourself in these environments of people that come from Nigeria or may come from Trinidad and Tobago or may come from Barbados and, that, and actually seeing that we all go through the same type of different types of things. We just have different diction. We say things in different ways, we dress in different ways, but in its root form, we all are in the same holistic um, endeavor. So that's kind of how I feel. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Alex, for the questions. Um, I think we've got a few questions in the room. I think, um, Travis, we have a very lively chat. I understand. Oh, we have a few. Um, and I think I will, there are a few that were anonymous questions, and I think they were answered after the fact. But there's one from Nancy in the room, and it's for Nate you specifically. Um, uh, Nancy wants to know those nights when the group with you were staying and sleeping and, and holding vigil, were you aware that a life was taking place? For me, um, I. Really, really remember seeing her. Um, and at the point when she started befriending us, I was not paying attention. Karen is the more um, personable, <laughs> friendly person. <laughs> so I, I am more. I was more sensitive to what was going on with the fans. And Karen was the people, was the person who was bringing people in. People, I, I don't choose people. People choose me. So Karen is a Karen is the person who was bringing people in. So. I, I knew of Eliza, but just on the peripheral. And I was just discussing with her today. The, the, the one of the scariest days for me was like December 15th, when um, it was like five of us on Dillon Plaza and about 25 pro boys. And they were menacing us, like the five of us. And initially it was just four of us. And then this person was coming toward me that I thought I knew, but I really wasn't sure who the person was. And she was like, are you okay? And so she made the fifth person, and it was a scary, it was one of the scariest times that we were there, and she was there with us. And I, I kind of knew who she was, but I really didn't know who she was. But then I was so taken up with all that was going on with these people menacing us with the garbage bags and pulling down all the signs and stuff like that. I'm so, pretty sure she already bought you hot chocolate by then. Oh, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other, but the part about that that was really crazy is I was like, I just was. I saw what was going on and I just beelined at, at Nadine. Like, yeah. I, so, like, she just sees this person yeah. running at her. Oh which I, 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 I was it's very fair to be a little afraid. Like, this person just running right at you. But it was because I saw these other guys coming from behind. So, like, I, I thought I was, the other part is I was taking these photos typically at like 5 to 6 a.m. So, it was typically during sleepy time because they would get up in time and do the dance. Mm -hmm. Except Karen would, Karen's the first one that caught me one day. So, she mm -hmm. actually, I, I was biking by on my way to work and she, had clearly seen me like she had I, had, I was there every several day, times and, several times and she just kind of was like hey like it was i think you actually did exactly that where you were like you're not stopped like i've got you now and <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a, a very brief chat but i explained like what i was doing she's like yep i've seen you around and i'm i'm aware of you and i'm karen and like you're part of this now and it was it was very much that and so when i would come back um i tried to start taking more photos during the day because obviously life is better uh and I was also only using an iPhone for the most part. So again, light is better. And so when I was coming in during midday, then it was much easier to start having conversations. But for a while it was 
um, not intentionally anonymous, but I just wasn't trying to be frightening. I, I watched you like, you know, in the chair like this, like half asleep. Before. We didn't actually have to do anything until the sun rose. And then we had to, at 7 a.m., wake up people in that house with some <laughs> profanity uh, at 102 decibels while they do wave the Trinidadian flag. And I mean, we just had a thing. We had our sunrise thing for them. And, um, but you know, I watched you with my eyes half shut like a few times until I finally realized you were like a regular. <laughs> and there were um, a number of people who came through. They didn't, I would pass everything to every day. I can't say, you know, twice a week, but there were regular people who came and took photos of the beds. Um, we've got some questions in the room. I just want to say quickly, I know there is another amazing talk um, on Campus Up 6. If anybody needs to bounce for that or go online for that, totally understood. Um, but we'll keep going. <laughs> um, so uh, those in the room? Yeah. Over there in the green? Okay. So I feel like um, during 2020, we saw a lot of performative activism and uh, a lot of disingenuous signage. Was that kind of filtered out um, during the process of like, you know, certain things you recognized weren't genuine and you took down? Or during the scanning and the process of you guys like viewing the signs and talking about how you introspectively looked at the signs, was there any filtering out in that way? Um, I only filtered out what I decided was the white um, Christian nationalism stuff. That's the only thing I filtered out. I, any, anything else I felt, if it was a message that was related to Black Lives Matter or feminism or anti-Trump, whatever it is, I left. The only thing I filtered out was the overly um, Christian religious stuff that I know was coming from their, um, from them to pacify us and to shut us up. And I've scanned whatever Nadine gave me. Can I can I just <laughs> say about the whole the that's where we went through that thing with people like this is performative, that's performative. Our our purpose, first of all, I come from a theater background and approach everything like literally from a theater perspective. And it 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 actually functionally served us in a lot of different ways. Someday there's a book just on that. And um Fundamentally, we knew that the stuff on the fence was safer the more people that knew about it. So getting press and, and having it be someplace where people go made us, made the space safer. So we were performing. And in fact, in the, in the early times, like I would literally be like, okay, there's cameras around, Nadine, Take your take this and go we'll stand over there because I would see the vantage point where they were to get stuff in the paper so that they couldn't as easily destroy it. If it's this little because it doesn't exist until it's in the media. So the idea was that, you know, sometimes and it wasn't like, you know, a few of us are spending the night there. It's literally two cop cars the entire time and Nadine by herself or yeah. me by myself or both of us together and sometimes a random unhoused person who talks to people I can't see. <laughs> you know, like that, it wasn't like a group, of, we could not get people out for the long haul. Mm -hmm. So it was very much like a tag team thing and performative saved us. So I don't know, like I understand disingenuous performative, but the word performative itself, how can you tell disingenuous if you don't know the intent behind it? And I don't know that after somebody puts it up, you can say whether it's disingenuous or not, because it could have been genuine to that human. But the performance based stuff, we were all about it. So what I, I can follow up on is some people came to the fence just for themselves. Like they came to the fence to put their personal information so people could contact them for a business opportunity. There was one person in particular who came like every other morning and he put a, a, a scan code, he would plaster his scan code on the signs. Mm -hmm. And initially I didn't 
say anything about it or do anything about it. But one day I scanned it to see what it was because I didn't know what it was. And it was a book that he wrote that didn't have anything to do with it. So then I started, once he started putting it, I started pulling it off because that, I knew he was just being opportunistic. It had nothing to do about Black Lives Matter. It had nothing to do about his feeling. It wasn't a message of solidarity. It just was about him. So no, I pulled, I pulled that off. So so that I I I, I um think. but there was another person who had um it was a um a person from the LGBTQ community who had something that was um, business related. I left it because it was part of our community and who is for me to determine you know what somebody could put on the fence because I have so much stuff on the fence that came from from me originally before the fence even existed that I put on the fence. So I didn't. I didn't decide who can put what and you know, except as I said. There was that white guy that showed up with remember those little paintings that had no text right. on them, no nothing. Right. Nothing right. 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 And, and I said to him, Does that's, that have anything to do true. with Black Lives? Because this is a Black Lives Matter Memorial Fence. Yeah. And he kind of like walks a little away from me and just kind of leaned him up against the fence because <laughs> the starving press would show up periodically. Yeah. So then like musicians yeah. so that didn't would show up sense. just to like be in front of the press playing music, or mm -hmm. certain preachers who wanted to be in front of the press doing that. I mean, we were there 24-7 and they came to us. Mm -hmm. So we used that. But uh, when people, you could tell they were just showing up because there was more starving press around right now, um, or if we actually caught somebody, like the like the thing is, like you don't know if it's a white person or not. But I watched this white guy try to lean his art up against there, and I was like, no. And then later, you tried to put it in a bag, and I was like, we are throwing that shit away. <laughs> <laughs> I actually still have it. Do I you really? I still have it. You didn't scan it, did you? I did scan okay, it, but I didn't put it. <laughs> no. It was actually even a sign on the fence that was like, this isn't your photo op. Right. Which mm -hmm. um, actually led to dozens of people every afternoon would take selfies in front of this is not your photo op. Right. It, was, it was it was this really weird mm -hmm. uh, practice. But the, the other piece to it is for like selecting for the Library of Congress, there were so many messages. And so luckily I was taking photos every day so I could show the curator and make sure we were providing a holistic message because we were taking so few pieces. That was also a piece to it. Like we want to make sure that it's representative of the breadth of what was being discussed on there. So election uh, judicial branch, <laughs> uh, so, social justice, uh, uh, police suppression, uh, local DC issues, all of that we wanted to make sure was captured. And like, that was also part of why getting everything scanned it was to just say, we're not making a judgment call here. This is, if you want to know what was on the fence that day, this is what was on the fence that day. But I, one of the items that went to Howard University of that female, there's, a, there's the one with the female, that wasn't even taking a Black Lives Matter pattern. That was on the mall for, I think, the 28th um, photo of it. The photo no, that, no, no, no. right, that yeah. photo, they brought, they brought five or six of them that uh -huh. they took on while they were on the mall. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. and placed it on the fence. But I think that was the only one that survived because people were ripping them off or whatever. But that, again, that was not BLM, that was not um, on the plaza that was taken on the on the wall. I think you might have had one more question on the side of the room. No? Yeah. Do, do we have anybody on the chat? Um, Still or? Well, we, just, we just got one. Let me, okay. let me read it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, Lisa, there's a couple of quick things. Um, all your photos, I don't know how many times they've been Where did they go? <laughs> yeah, um, whatever. Um, where, besides your camera or your computer, where did they live in the Library of Congress? Yeah, great question. Uh, <laughs> um, so right now they're backed up in three locations. Um, I have an Amazon account, I have an external hard drive, and then um, quite a few of them are on my phone. A small number of them are going to go to the Library of Congress. Uh, the uh, photography curators of the, in my division have done an amazing job of working with local uh, photographers throughout uh, coast to coast to make sure that they document the Black Lives Matter protest movement, um, predominantly by Black photographers. Um, that was a priority. This. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. So it's in, they're in a couple of places. So, you know, the cobbler has no shoes. Archivists are not always great about backing up their stuff. These are so important to me that I've done my diligence on that side of things. And then a small number will go to the library's collection at some point. So, I mean, I mean as far as who you're taking them for, I mean, who? Oh, it was a compulsion. I wasn't was taking I, I, Yeah, they were entirely for myself. They were never, it was never a commission by the library or anything of that sort. It was just a, 
and, yeah, incredibly important thing that I just I knew I was getting to witness it. And every day I was putting a few of them um, in my like Instagram story so that everyone who I knew across the country and around the world could see what was going on. And several of them would say, "Okay, hey, can I pass this on?" And I was like, "Yeah, like." literally as many people as can see these i would like them to see it because this is something that is so hard to understand and is being so mediated by media that mm -hmm. it was the best i could offer um in the moment yeah they don't exist on a website or no not not yet I, i've done a very bad job of taking the next step <laughs> I, I have the amazon link <laughs> <laughs> I want to say a huge thank you. Um, I think we could potentially be here chatting. And I think I think we're all into it. Um, Travis, I think we had over a hundred and yeah, ten folks. Did we really? Yeah. Yeah. Online only, and then there were another bunch of us here. Um, so I think that speaks to just the power of what you've done together and what you continue to do. So thank you for what I say too. That's really important for in our shared. Our history and our shared experience. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. And thank you for inviting us. And thank you for letting us be together for yes. the first time. Yes. 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 Are you guys met a person? No. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I have met. I have met um, Eliza, Jody, and um, well, Karen. So today I met Laura for the first time in person and Dunya for the first time in person. Yeah. And Layla. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, we have not all been in the same room ever. This is like a real pandemic yeah. story. Yes, well, um, no, definitely. And, you know, we keep feeling that in our lives. So it's been just an honor. And I thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.